You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resimsinski and I, Niels Carstel Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listener, this podcast series is all about voicing our differences on the one topic that brings us together, namely systematic investing, using the often overlooked but very robust strategy of trend following. We hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Rich, which is always fun and insightful. But also, I would also like to highlight uh, our Wednesday episode. Uh, This week it was uh, on energy and natural resources with Adam uh, Rosenzweig, where not only did we discuss the emerging energy crisis, and the new battle between the climate greens and the nature greens. But we also discussed how the energy sector has evolved over time and the dark side of renewable energy and why Moss law does not apply to wind and solar energy. And not least, how cheap energy leads to distortion and malinvestment uh, in the energy space. So if you missed any of those, I would highly encourage you to go and listen to them after this episode. Now, before I get to my normal topics, I do have a special announcement because I'm working on a project where I'm looking for 100 true fans of the podcast to help us out. It's a bit of a secret project, I have to say. So if you want to be part of it, it is important that you can keep a secret. And actually, I'm not kidding here. Um, It won't take too much of your time, but it does require a little bit of work uh, each week on a specific day of the week. Now, that's pretty much all I can share uh, at this stage. But for those of you who want to help us out on this project, could you do me a favor and send me an email to a special email address called optin at toptradersonplug.com. So it's O-P-T-I-N at toptradersonplug.com. And if you wouldn't mind, in the uh, subject line, put special project. And then, of course, uh, do leave your full name. And then I'll get back to you in a few days with more details. As mentioned, I'm looking for about 100 people. So if you want to help us out, which I truly hope you do, please make sure that, uh, and, and in order to be part of this project, please make sure you're one of the first 100 people who reaches out. So thank you very much for that. Mark, it is wonderful to have you back this week uh, for you know another eventful week, another eventful month since you were last on the on the podcast. Um, so, uh, how are you doing? How are things where you are? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, I f- I felt pretty good by the end of, end of this uh, week, all the as a lot of volatility. Uh, and I sort of half joke sometimes when the volatility gets so high, you feel like you want to get a, in the fetal position underneath your desk. Uh, now. And that's a great part about you know using a quantitative system. You don't have to f- suffer from regret if you make a decision at one point in a day, and then the market reverses, and you feel as though, boy, I, I made the wrong choice. So and we should talk a little bit about, I think, the idea of regret. Now, that being said, uh, I'll give you a plug. I did listen to the Adams uh, podcast on commodities, and uh, I love the work they do. And it's really important, if, even if you're a trend follower, to listen to some of their arguments because they really do give you a long uh, the, the long story for why there might be long trends in some commodity markets. Yeah, no, uh, I appreciate that. Um, And yeah, we'll definitely dive into all sorts of topics. Uh, You brought along a lot uh, of interesting things we're going to talk about today. Maybe a little bit different from what we normally talk about today. I think it'll be more kind of laser focused in some sense, uh, maybe not so much big picture. So that'll be fun. But of course, one of the things that um, indeed Adam was talking about uh, on our recent conversation that has an impact directly on what's been going on this week is, of course, inflation. And the April Consumer Price Index came out above expectation this week, climbing 8.3% over the last year's measure. Economists were forecasting a 8% year-over-year change uh, as the prior year comparison continued to rise. Um, but that 
did not uh, happen this week. In fact, a deconstruction of the report fails to reveal any instances of weakness. Now, of course, the May CPI number is still a few weeks uh, away, uh, so we don't really have any uh, estimates for that. But mathematically, at least, one would expect that it might be a little bit lower on the year-to-year change. Now, with inflation remaining exceptionally high, policymakers and central banks have been saber-rattling. President Biden even said that the number one threat to the economy is inflation and that he is, quote-unquote, confident the Fed will do its job uh, with that in mind, uh, unquote here. But is it really the Fed that single-handedly causes the current um, level of inflation via its quantitative easing program? Or do the recent spending bills also have to take some of the responsibility? Let's not forget that billions of dollars of the current spending bill remain unspent and sit on the balance sheets of the states in the US ready to be spent on what they see fit. Perhaps, fortuitously, the uh, Build Back Better bill did not pass uh, so we didn't get the 2.2 trillion of additional um, kind of made up money, uh, which would have been added to the liquidity issues. As Milton Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. For their part, since the 180 degree U-turn on inflation back in December, the various members of the Open Market Committee continue to expose their commitment to getting inflation under control while achieving a smooth uh, deceleration of the economy. Sorry to break the news to the committee, but it doesn't happen that way. To reduce inflation, the excess liquidity will need to be withdrawn from the system. Borrowing will slow, growth will contract. The trend growth of the US economy is 2%, and it has been and it has been well above that rate since the second quarter of 2020. Getting back to trend is likely to be painful and leave the current members of the FOMC and the political leadership with a dubious legacy. Now, Mark, I wanted to bring you in at this stage and just uh, sort of, you know, the usual where we talk a little bit about what you have been noticing or focusing on the last few weeks. Um, anything in particular that's caught your attention? Well, well, the first thing I'd like uh, to start with is, uh, which applies to all of these policy issues, and this is uh, a comment from the uh, late uh, Rudy Dornbush, who is the uh, MIT professor in economics. And, and he said, things take longer to happen than you think they will. Then they happen faster than you thought they could. And, and when you think about the inflation problem, this is uh, an exact scenario of Dornbush. Is that we've been talking about excess money and then the impact it would have on uh, inflation for a long time, and but it just took a long time to happen, and then then all of a sudden, once inf- uh, inflation exploded on the upside, it happened faster than we thought it uh, thought it could. So so this is exactly what we're seeing is is that people have been surprised so uh, uh, by inflation. But getting back yeah. to trend, uh, trend following, I think I want to talk about two things. What I call the 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 power and the paranoia of trend following, <laughs> and uh, you know when you look at uh, we see what the, the power that's been going on for trend following its value added. Uh, it's just been tremendous this year, and I think we also want to talk a little bit about okay. Can this continue? And should we go back in history and sort of say, what is this environment now like? And if it's similar to that past environment, could the performance we're seeing uh, in trend following continue? Okay. No, that's fine. We'll definitely dive into that, plus a few more uh, very interesting topics. In terms of a quick trend following update for the week, uh, my overall feel is that trend followers uh, probably saw a little bit of a correction in their returns in the last five trading days. Um, despite the fact that the moves were pretty big, I actually think probably the performance only corrected uh, um, modestly, I would say. On the notable side, I would say the drop in yields uh, during the week probably you know, was the main reason for for uh, trend followers losing a bit of money. 
Uh, clearly, the uh, global bond prices have been lifted a little bit off the uh, the lows, uh, the recent lows. But we are still long term in some downtrend. So I'm not suggesting that this is any any beginning of of a rever of a reversal in in a bigger sense. Um, anyways, also other things that uh, from a trend following perspective, probably gold saw a little bit of weakness. Um, but other than that, most other sectors performed fairly well. Um, currencies, maybe with the exception of the yen, had a good week. Energies, um, looks like they could have been probably flat for the week overall. But then we had other sectors like grains that had a strong week, as far as I can tell, in particular uh, wheat. And also, despite the continued sort of uh, pressure and falls in the equity markets, I actually don't think trend follows has a lot of equity exposure at the moment. So I wouldn't be surprised if that sector, despite it uh, being um, down yet again, um, it probably was pretty uneventful uh, from a performance point of view. The trend barometer is incredibly strong still. Uh, I had a reading of 77 last night. Uh, just confirms this environment we're in uh, right now. So back to the point that you made, uh, Mark, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then you have the, this kind of this volatility space, which is really lackluster, uh, if I can put it that way. It's kind of just more of the same that we've seen all year. Uh, for most of the week, uh, we saw a continuous decline in quote-unquote uncertainty or fixed strike volatility. And that was accompanied by a flattening uh, skew slope of the S&P 500 options. And the flattening um, skew slope in particular is not only beyond what we could have expected, but it also is the fastest or the flattest, I should say, since early 2013. So that's, uh, that's 10 years now. Relatively speaking, investors, you know, Concerned about further declines in the S&P 500? Well, if they are, they can hedge again this much cheaper than they have been uh, for a while. And nevertheless, the uh, sharply flattening skew slope helps to explain also why the VIX declined 1.3 point decline, uh, closing at 28.9 in a week where the S&P declined 2.4%. I mean, this is not usual stuff, I have to say. It's also worth mentioning that despite the market being temporarily down 19.6%, uh, uh, I think it was Thursday from the all-time high, uh, this is the S&P I'm referring to, uh, it seemed more like a steady decline uh, with the absence of any capitulation, uh, if you look at it like that. Again, this has been a repeating theme of all of 2022. And in fact, the market has not seen a three standard deviation move in the S&P 500 since 2020, which seems to provide investors with enough confidence to refrain from excessively reaching for additional downside protection at the moment. So interesting stuff uh, all around, um, but with very different uh, outcomes so far this year in terms of performance, of course, volatility suffering and trend following having a, a very strong start to the year, uh, which is very topical, actually, because I noticed that your first uh, topic for today, uh, you label that trends, 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 and no diversification. So I'm kind of curious where we're heading with this one, Mark. Well, one of the issues that comes in is, is that what we find out is, is, is that, that the, you make the most money as a trend follower when oftentimes a lot of markets start to correlate to a common factor. And uh, I think it's starting to change over in the last week. But, uh, you know, following some of the trend signals I had is, is, is that you had all the currencies moving in the same direction, all the bonds moving in the same direction, all stock indices moving in the same direction, all metals moving in the same direction, all, uh, you know, many of the commodities moving in the same direction. So as subsectors, all of them were moving in the same direction and they were moving in the same direction for short, intermediate and long-term trends. And you sort of say like, well, let's look at the performance of some of the, uh, you know, CTAs. CTA performance was great because everything was moving in the same direction. If anything, that because you get so many signals all moving together and are all similar, the difference in performance between one CTA and the next would be, okay, how much a constraint do you put on you know, that common positioning? 
And how do you sort of dampen down the volatility? Because if you put all your positions on in the same way, it's just that you would have made a ton of money, but you'd be taking on a lot of risk. So, so I think that the focus should be is, is that, and I don't want to say it's a, a dirty little secret, but you do very well as a trend follower when there's a common uh, factor that's driving all markets and a lot of markets are moving all together. Yeah. So, so uh, and, and so let me just stop you there and, 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 and a few things to, um, to think about. So I agree uh, that there's definitely some uh, common theme going on. And if I was going to put one finger on one topic that you could say is driving a lot of what's going on to some extent, it would be inflation, right? We, you know, that certainly caused the bonds to go down and certainly is reflected in, in the commodity prices, even though commodity prices are not going up because of inflation, they're the ones causing the inflation, uh, and so on and so forth. But I, um, But what's been interesting to me is that even though you say there's no diversification per se, and I know you're using this a little bit metaphorically, right? I actually feel that there's a lot of breath in the performance right now, and I actually feel that the performance is not happening necessarily at the same time, meaning in the beginning of the year, it was certain sectors uh, doing well and, and leading the pack. Then another sector took over. Of course, we had energies in particular in February and March, right? Uh, then in April, uh, from memory, I think it was currencies that took over and became the uh, the, the most profitable sector. And, um, and obviously, may we don't know yet what that's going to be. So I do feel that there is kind of a nice kind of um, rotation, if I can put it that way, in terms of where the performance is coming from. It's not coming at the same time from the same source, is what I'm trying to say uh, when I look at it. Uh, at no, least. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. There's some sectors that become dominant for a short period of time. But within those dominant sectors, you have uh, some other groups that are trend following that just that, that they continue to grind in the same direction. And so a perfect example is, is that you look at the fixed income. Uh, you know, if you're sh uh, up until probably this week uh, for 2022, if you were short fixed income across two fives, tens, thirties, boons, bobbles, gilts, you know, you were doing fine. This is it now. Energy could have led for a portion of that sector, but you know, if you're a more uh, intermediate to long term uh, trend follower, and and that means you know, uh, greater than at least a week, to, uh, two weeks, this is that. This was just a uh, a great situation because all the markets were moving together. I think commodities were early on in the Ukraine crisis. They were all moving together. Now we're getting more uh, dispersion and differentiation in the commodity sector relative to what we've seen in other sectors. Uh, but you look at the yen, the, uh, the move in the yen up until this week has been relentless and it's been one directional. And this is what makes it sort of different than other points in history. So, so for example, is that we had a common factor in 2008 during the Great Recession, but it was actually fairly short. So you made a lot of money, but it was a very concentrated uh, feature. And, and in some sense, it was because the central banks intervened, so they arrested the trends that were occurring. What makes similar thing happened in 2020 is that we had a common factor, but the government came in to arrest the trend. So sometimes people didn't make as much. In fact, it, sometimes you got whipsawed in, in March of 2020. 2022 is different because we have a common set of factors. We had Ukraine war, we got inflation, but this time we haven't seen government coming in to arrest the basic direction because they're actually behind the curve in what the, is the common factor. So this will last longer for the simple reason is, is that the normal situation that we've seen in crises over the last 20 years is that the government come in will that and will arrest or reverse the trends that were appearing from the real economy. This time, they haven't been able to do it, and this time, they may not be able to do it. 
Exactly. I think that's a very, very important point you made there, uh, the fact that they may not be able to do it. Um, so just just to put things in perspective, and I have to admit this is a little bit from memory, um, but I, I, I want to uh, just sort of dampen expectations a little bit uh, when we talk about how long can this run continue, right? So, of course, we advocate that it's not about whether trend following makes money every month. Uh, it's really how it does over a decade or two or three. So we're not that concerned about monthly, quarterly, or even annual returns per se. But from memory, at least, if I look at our own track record that goes back, uh, at least for the current strategy, um, you know, almost 38 years now, I don't think we've had more than eight months in a row of positive performance, and that's over 38 years. So we're getting to we're getting closer to to that period. I think the industry as a whole is probably running at this is the sixth month where we're probably positive in a row. So we're getting to a point where at some point there will be some retracements and there will be some uh, negative monthly performance from the industry, which people should definitely not interpret as, oh, now it's all over, the trend has, has ended. I don't subscribe to that because I actually do subscribe to your view. And I talked about it on the podcast a, a few weeks ago that I think this is a, a sh- regime shift in the way the global economy is is set up. And, and that should mean something that I was alluding to before. I see more divergence in the markets right now than I've seen for a long time, which is incredibly positive for a strategy like trend following. I mean, what we don't like is convergence where there's a lot of stability in the world. Um, but as you alluded to, the central banks who have been kind of the... Um, the guardians for stability, they maybe have been put out of action uh, to some extent, and and therefore we're going to see more divergence, uh, which should benefit um, these directionally based strategies, and especially strategies where you don't really have to have an opinion about whether something can happen or not. I mean, um, because I think this is the other theme that I've been talking about, Mark, um, in, in the last few weeks uh, since you were on, and that is I do think we have to imagine the unimaginable um i mean if you just look at some of the some of the stuff that's happened in the markets the last few months i mean uh, look at the darling of uh, 2020 and 2021 arc i mean their funds are down like 70 percent from the highs uh, or something like that and and there's a whole list of that i mean coinbase the crypto exchange which was hailed like uh, i don't know what when it came out and went on the exchange i think the only ones who's benefited from that ipo must be the people who sold their shares at the ipo because it's down like 80 percent from the high obviously we had stable coins this week that became very unstable and one of them went to zero or pretty much zero so there's a lot of stuff going on right now, um, and uh, I, but I don't think stability is going to be the order of the day uh, going forward. Well, well, I go back to the Dornbush comment about that uh, things take longer to uh, to happen than you think they will, but they happen faster because you look at the losses we've seen in crypto, for example, is greater than the amount of losses we saw in subprime mortgages back in, really? the, uh, wow. in the day so so the amount of value that's been erased is is much greater so now i think the important part for uh for many listeners would be that there's a difference between the regime environment and the trading environment and so and so we need to make a s- distinction between the two and so the trading environment uh you know, I have a number of paranoias about, and we'll talk about it in just a second. So that's, you know, what are we going to do or how are we going to make money in uh, the next month? Okay. Uh, we've had a lot of months of positive performance for trend following. That is probably not going to continue. The regime environment is, how is this environment different than maybe what we've seen over the last 10 years? And in some sense, you could sort of say we're more in a 70s type of environment going forward than a 2010 environment. And if you go way back, you know, to the 70s and you look at trend following in the 80s, the 70s, 80s were really the the, the premier time to be a trend follower because there were long term uh, diversifications. There was policies that were taking a long time to have to be, you know, work through the system. And first is that we were behind the curve in the 70s. Then we had a shock and then we were ahead of the curve. Uh, 
So, which uh, we can delve into a little bit more deeply. But then we went to the 90s and the 2000s period where we had the great moderation. All the central banks were inflation targeting and they're doing a good job. Uh, you had the Greenspan put, uh, which arrested any time financial markets really started to fall out of bed and, ha- and started to you know, move lower. And so we're moving away from, okay, central banks providing a a downside put we're away from the area of inflation targeting so so there was a shift away from inflation targeting thinking and now we're moving into a period of that's more 70s and 80s alike. and like and those were probably the periods of greatest trend following advantage relatives to some other periods yeah, no, for sure. I mean, certainly if if I look at our track record, you know, the 70s and the 80s and the 90s were certainly strong, uh, without a doubt. And I think that the hardest period for, for trend followers has probably been, you know, 2015 to late 2019 or thereabouts. I think that's for sure was a more challenging period. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I share that view. Um, I think we could be in for a, a new um, revival, so to speak, even though I think that people must never lose sight of the fact that trend following performance, as, as long as you zoom out, it becomes incredibly consistent. Um, we see no difference between our returns in the last 38 years compared to the last 10 years. They are almost annualized identical. And even if you just pick a random period like the last 15, 16 years, again, almost uh, identical. So that, to me, gives a lot of confidence to the underlying methodology of trend following. Uh, then, of course, you, as you said, although you did say something I picked up on uh, about that you don't think there's going to be a lot of performance dispersion between managers because all the markets are trending, I do feel that when I look at the numbers, and you know Richard and I, we publish once a month this uh, trend following report where we look at the top 59 or 60 trend followers in the world and we rank them and we do all sorts of number crunching and come up with our uh, own suggestions to how you can replace the 60-40 with another 40, so to speak, all of that stuff. I mean, I do see some difference in performance, but it's far. I mean, that's how it should be uh, in the short term. Uh, and in the long run, well, the, the managers who knows what they're doing, frankly, they're the one they're always going to be in the long term uh, at the top of the table. Well, let's make a distinction. As I, I think that there is going to be less dispersion on the signals of trend. Right. There's more dispersion on how you manage the risk and sector difference performance. So uh, a big difference was this is that if you had a high commodity exposure, let's say through the uh, through April, this is that you were doing very well relative to something that uh, a manager that had uh, very little commodity exposure. So commodities were, were were doing fantastic. We'll sort of say that those who had uh, have had a lot of currency exposure, you know, or uh, overweighted in ex- currency exposure, done very very well. The U.S. dollar has been up since the low of last year about fourteen percent, and and in the volatility really is always lower in in currencies. So if you lever that up, it's 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 a huge number on a, on a relative risk weighted basis, or even just the fact that well, because I'm getting so many signals that are similar what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce my overall exposure because I've got sort of similarity in signals. Okay, Those people who say that I'm going to be less sensitive to similarity of, of signals are doing better than those people who say I'm worried about this and I'm going to r- constrain the amount of exposure that I have. So, so that's the uh, portfolio construction is going to be a bigger driver of performance than the signal itself. So speaking about portfolio construction, maybe I can tee up a little topic for Jerry next week when he comes on, um, as he's uh, probably right now listening to us uh, on the treadmill. One of the shifts that I've seen, and you know, lately with Jerry, is this massive expansion of number of markets in the portfolio, really going for the maximum 
amount of diversification, small, you know, small exposure, but to lots of markets, right? That is something that fewer managers, I feel, did five years ago. More managers uh, do now, and, and in particular, some of the ones we know really well uh, have embraced, including Jerry. So uh, I, I would be curious to know your thoughts on that and also whether there is because I'm kind of debating internally with myself this thing about, because let me put it this way. I don't see in the data, frankly, that one group, whether they stick with the classical 50, 60 markets or whether they go 200 plus markets, I don't see clear evidence that one is better than the other. I really don't. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on that whole debate. Um, and maybe that can give us a little bit to... Um, respond with when we get Jerry on next Yeah, and, and I've always sort of viewed that uh, that you want to try to have a lot of diversification, having a lot of different market sectors, uh, having a lot of exposure in markets is, is a good thing. So there's no question about that, especially if it's if it's a uncorrelated type of asset. So, uh, But once you get beyond 50, 60 or whatever, uh, a certain number, there gets to be diminishing returns. And that at that point, I think that there there's a diversification of style or timing. So whether it could be a moving average versus a breakout, uh, whether a short-term, intermediate, long-term will give you more value added than adding more markets. Yeah, that is that is interesting because Rich, of course, advocates clearly that he likes having more types of trend following in his portfolio, not just more markets. And he feels that by having more models or strategies uh, of trend following inside his program, it actually also allows him to trade more markets per se. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Jerry is more in the camp of saying, I'm going to use one methodology, of course, with different time frames, of course, no problem, but I'm going to add more markets to that. And then, of course, you also say that there is a limit at some point. Um, I do think, though, that the maybe five or seven years ago, we probably could say that a lot of managers, once they got to 50, 60 markets, they would stop there because those are kind of the classical trend following very liquid markets. I do think that that number has gone up, meaning I think there are more peop people today probably saying, okay, but I've got 80 markets in my portfolio because, I mean, nobody was talking about Dutch net gas and UK net gas, you know, two years ago, frankly, uh, very few. Then, of course, you had the whole Chinese uh, um, commodity markets as well. Plus, you have other energy contracts, carbon uh, emissions and all of that. So I do think that probably there are more managers today uh, trading, say, 80 markets than there were five years ago. And I don't think that necessarily, uh, because they are still uncorrelated in, in many respects. And then you have those who have gone from the, quote unquote, more exotic or alternative markets where you either go off exchange or you're trading something that is not so easy to uh, get your hands on. Um, and they will obviously add uh, a lot of markets. And then you have, of course, people who would embrace single stocks that can also add at least, quote unquote, markets. I don't know how how uncorrelated they are because uh, when the proverbial hits the fan, they probably are very correlated. Maybe they're not uh, all the time. So do you, is that something you've been looking into kind of what in, in terms of portfolio construction? Where, where do you think the optimal lies? And again, as I said, I want to be absolutely clear. I have not seen any clear signs to me that having more markets gives you better returns. Maybe it's smoother. I don't know. Could be. Um, but I'm not even sure that they, they are smoother. So as long as you have your basic covered in terms of your 10 different sectors and uh, different markets within these sectors and all of that to get to your, as I said, 60 markets or so, I, uh, I have yet to see clear evidence of the benefit, even though the argument of chasing outliers, the more markets you trade, the more outliers, outliers you possibly can find, and that's true. But of course, that's also the, you know, you have to take into account you're going to be trading that with smaller risk budgets, right? So you're not going to get the same juice from finding that outlier compared to if that outlier happened in a 60 market portfolio where you have more risk per trade. So lots of considerations. There's 
two answers are to unpack your comment. There's two parts to it. One is trade the people who have traded 50 markets and then go to 60, 70, 80 in the future side. So they're going to be trading uh, smaller markets that are less liquid. Uh, and I will sort of say that uh, if you trade more foreign uh, futures uh, and smaller markets, it takes a lot more time, effort, and work to just get the execution done. Your cost of trading is going to be higher. So, so you have to have better infrastructure to go, we'll say, down in volume or the smaller markets that might get you excess returns. So some people say, oh, that's easy to trade. This is that depending on the size of your organization, depending on the size of your your trading you know uh environment is is that the cost uh the costs do go up and it's a lot harder to trade trade these things especially in asian markets and even you could have a a prime broker uh you know that that is clearing the trades but they're not really uh have an ex uh, have a membership at all the exchanges so they're going to have to then give up the trade to another clearing firm there's added costs with there so so things become more complex when you go uh down market in terms of volume so so it's not it's not easy where you just plug in and add one so that, that's first one second in terms of trading all the markets this is that the question is always do you trade all of those markets or do you take a larger universe and you filter through those to sort of do the classic cross-sectional and then you sort of say i'm going to take the top 10 longs and the top uh in the bottom 10 shorts so so a lot has to do with when you sort of say i'm going to trade more markets are you searching more markets for trends or are you trading all of those markets and so so in some senses is that if i trade uh you know the Russell 2000, and uh, you could do it on a momentum basis, and then you sort of rank order all of the trends, and then you say, well, I'm going to buy the uh, the the top 10 percent and sell the bottom 10 percent. You're going to get some of the extremes, but you're cutting out, you know, that 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 middle. You just don't trade them. You search through them, but you may not trade them. So so the question you always have to ask when you talk about trading more markets: Are you searching through more markets or you're trading all of those markets and and that's a big distinction it is and i just wanted to interrupt you there and and say that i'm i'm there's certainly a, a couple of firms out there that that I'm, i get the feeling that that's what they're doing by searching more markets but not necessarily you know treat them equally right so to me that's what i would call relative trend following where they kind of go for the strongest trends and i am I have to admit, I'm not a fan um, because I think it goes against some of the core principles of trend following, which is knowing what you don't know. And I think once you start to rank stuff, you're starting to put on some assumptions about the future. And I just think we're getting away from uh, what I is, believe is the uh, one of the strongest uh, and most important parts of trend following, and that is knowing what you don't know, and therefore you treat everything equal, and you make no assumptions about what the future looks like. So um, now I've worked with you know cross-sectional um, you know, trading and currencies where you sort of do the rank ordering, and then we base it on on other factors, and and it works uh, fairly well. When you get to big stock universes, it does work reasonably well. But you have a different set of risks than if you trade the entire universe. And this is where, you know, when I talked before at the beginning of the podcast about the uh, the paranoia I have right now as a, tre uh, as a trend follower, this, this is sort of a good segue into the, this, sure. this topic. Go for it. So in some senses is that while a good trend follower follows his model and then doesn't fret about what's going on in the market, because in some sense, the model is telling me what my trends are. I follow the model and, you know, I should not emotionally be uh, invested on whether it's a bad day or good day on Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. But I think that even as a model builder, you still uh, you still have an emotional commitment to what your models are doing. And a couple of things that always jump out, and I'll start one with, uh, with uh, you know, comments that John Henry used to always make. Trends last longer than expected. So 
no matter how long you think the trends are going in reality, that they're probably going to last longer than what you thought, which is a, a variation on the Rudy Dornbush comment. And so, so I think anybody who thought that uh, whether it was bonds, currencies, you know, stock indices, I don't think anyone thought that these trends would last as long as they have. So you're constantly getting nervous because you say, yes, this could last longer than expected. I, I'm seeing this last longer, but I'm getting nervous because I don't expect them to last this long. Second paranoia that you have is almost what I call the, the paranoia of reversals. So while on the one hand you say trends last longer than expected, my, I, my, I do know that when the reversal comes, if you have a long-term trend, it's going to be violent and it's going to cost you a lot of money. Uh, because reversals usually occur are, are much faster than the trend that got you there. So, so a perfect trend, and let's say the yen, is is we stair step our way up. We just keep on making money, making money on the yen as the yen starts to decline. One day there's going to be an announcement from the Bank of Japan or something happens. Is that there's going to be a quick reversal? I'm going to give back a couple percent of that, and uh, and you're going to be licking your wounds. <laughs> so, the third is 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 that you always get nervous or paranoid when the distance between the market price and the trend starts to you know gap larger and larger so when i see that my prices are moving away from my trend and so there's there's that large gap regardless of where your stops are you can get, you're going to get nervous because what you're saying is that market prices seem to be moving ahead of what the past moving average has been telling uh, telling you and that's another sort of paranoia that you have and then i think the final paranoia is is, is what i call surprise paranoia is, is is that you know when things are all working in your favor the question is 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 the government going to do something and not say that they're malicious, but they're going to say is that usually, you know, uh, governments don't like the direction that markets take because it's providing information that may not be consistent with what they would like to see happen. So oil prices are higher than uh, uh, than what governments would like. Well, then the response is, well, we got to open up petroleum reserves. It may, may not work, but right away they try to do something to stop that. We'll sort of see this as that if there's a, a, a big decline in financial markets, this is that the Fed might say, say like, well, I think we're going to have to be more cautious of how we approach fighting inflation. So, which should be a big surprise. So, there's the things that keep you up at night. Is is there surprise action from the government? Are there going to be reversals that are going to be violent because there's new information that changes the narrative? And the good thing that trends might last longer than expected. And what is the distance between, you know, market prices and trends? Because in some sense, that's a good thing. But when it gets too far between those two, there's more likelihood there's going to be sort of some reversal or move back to the mean. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts uh, as you talk about all these things. One is um, that, I, I mean, I agree. We we know that uh, trend following has a couple of weaknesses. One of them is the reversals. The other one is the fact that when there are no trends, we lose a little bit of money, but it, that can take you know a long time. Th those are the two ways we tend to lose money. And actually, it's those are the two areas that we've spent uh, at our firm, um, you know, the last 15, 20 years trying to uh, improve upon. Um, so super important topics there. I was going to ask you, when you work with John Henry, for example, because I know, for example, with, with Bill Don, uh, the founder of our firm, that you could not tell on him whether it was an up 5% or up 10% day or down 5% or down 10% day. It had no, there was no emotional change in in, in the way uh, he was in the office, right? Um, uh, did you see the same? Because I think this is what makes some trend followers stand out, frankly. And of course, I don't know all trend followers, and I certainly haven't worked with all trend followers, so I don't know how they are in the day-to-day. -day. But I would love to know from you, when you work with John Henry, uh, whether that was this kind of the same that you noticed. I think he was very uh, 
even keeled in the senses is that uh, uh, the model was uh, working, we're following the model, there's a sort of a consistent, but that being said, is, is that human nature is as normal as is that, hey, if you're having a really good day, is, is that there's a certain bounce in your step when you walk in the office and say like, what I'm doing is pretty dar darn good. And similarly, is, is that if you're in a drawdown and things aren't working, it doesn't matter uh, how much you believe in the model. Is this is that you can sort of see the, there's a weight on everyone's shoulder. I think that that's hu human nature. So when I talk about this sort of paranoia, I think that uh, that you could have everything going well, but it's just the nature of uh, of even giving yourself to a model, there's still the nature of the fact that you realize this is that, okay, things aren't going to be perfect. Uh, if I have as current CTAs six months in a row of positive performance, the likelihood I'm going to get a seventh month or an eighth month is going to be harder and harder. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, absolutely. Um, but yet again, I mean, since we don't know how the returns will be distributed in the future, you can have one down month and then go on another uh, you know, nice run. And and the other thing is, of course, with amplitude, right? You can have three very strong months do better than even if you lose six months in a row with small losses. So this is why you can't, in my opinion, you can't time trend following. You really need to have it as a core allocation at all times. I've seen too many people um, try to be too clever about timing of trend following, and they tend to lose out. On, on some of the big runs. And of course, you can do all the math. It's very easy to do. And, uh, and I obviously, the same studies goes with the, um, with the equity markets. If, if you were out just of the 20 best trading days uh, of the S&P in the last, I can't remember how long that study goes back, I mean, your returns go down by more than 50% just from being out 20 trading days. The same with trend following. If you miss say, the, the best 10 monthly returns in the last 40 years, your returns are going to be incredibly uh, different uh, than, than if you're just stay hanging hanging with it. So, uh, yeah. Well, th we th go ahead, Mark. This is, a, this is a good topic for further discussion on timing of, of trend following because uh, I think that the timing of a long, short trend following program is very different than the timing of a long only investment like a mutual fund or an ETF. So, so I think that uh, there has been views and, and uh, I'll say that there are some sophisticated investors that have always talked about and used the idea that, well, if I buy into a drawdown for a trend follower, that that's the best time to do it. So wait until you get a 20% pullback and then buy into the trend trend follower. And in some senses is that uh, I think that's a little bit extreme, but I would sort of say that on uh, down periods, those are usually good times to invest in trend followers because usually that clears out a lot of trades. And so in some sense, you're reloading your set of trades between long and short. So if you have a, a slight downturn in, uh, in, uh, long only investment, uh, you still have to sort of make the guesses that the market is still going to have to go higher for you to make money. For a CTA that's both long and short in this trading, this is that you don't have to worry about you know whether the market is long. You just have to, in some sense, not that you worry about it. This is that when you see a drawdown, you uh, or if you see a down month, that means that some of the positions have been cleared out, and that means that your time to reload for new new positions and new directions for the for the market is uh, is much greater. Yeah, so it's generally speaking, it's a lower risk entry point uh, than, say, for example, now where everybody is hitting new all-time highs that could potentially be a little bit more risky. On the other hand, because clearly a lot of people have become much more interested in trend following, so we certainly see that in terms of new investors coming in to the various uh, strategies uh, we run. And I have to say to them that the best thing they can do is really just Take it step by step. You know, if they have a certain amount in mind that they want to invest, then just divide it in three and do it over three months because we, we really don't know uh, what the next period of return will be. So why not spread out like we do, as get some diversification on your entry point? It's not going to matter too much if you're invested for 10 or 20 or 30 years, of course, but, but still, it's always nice not to suffer a big loss the first month you're invested in a new strategy. Um, so I think, again... 
applying common sense, um, you can you can get a, a long way with just using common sense in many of these. Uh, I will sort of say is that a couple of years ago, sort of say, if you said, I said, what should be the right allocation for trend following this is that, that you got like numbers that were between like eh, zero. <laughs> and, and now, even if you sort of say like, I uh, use different optimizers, you do different with different constraints. If you said like, well, I had a 10 or 15 and 10% allocation of trend follower. Now the view is, this is like, 10%, that's all. I should have had double the amount of exposure in that. It's really funny you say that, Mark, because I do follow that uh, particular question because we get that all the time in terms of so how much, right? So the way um, we kind of like to look at it to give people uh, a range is by saying, well, what if you started your investment? Um, and let's just say if, to make it super simple, you could only invest in stocks, bonds and managed futures or trend following. And of course, in this example, I'm going to use our numbers. But even if you use the stock gen trend index, I think the, these could be even more extreme. I have a feeling right now. So if, if so, and then we go and say, OK, what if we started just before a crisis and just after the crisis had ended. So we take the tech bubble. So year 2000 was before and 2002, October was after. And we do the same with the great financial crisis, just, you know, 2007, late, I guess. And then March of 09 uh, at the end of the crisis. And then we look at what, and, and of course, people can say, well, we don't like to optimize uh, according to Sharp, but it's just one way of, of optimizing. So we just look at that. And the range allocation to trend following in the great uh, sorry in the tech bubble is actually quite consistent whether you did it before and after um, it's something like you know 15 percent to trend um, at the low which was before the crisis and about 19 percent if you started after the crisis so the big shift is not so much in terms of the trend following portion it's actually between the stocks and the bonds and i'm using the world government bond index and the msci world equity index to do these calculations and then we look at and this is even more extreme and then we look at the great financial crisis and what's happened in the last few months is that using these three investment instruments so equities bonds and trend following the bonds have completely disappeared. So whether you started before or after the great financial crisis, you should have had no bonds now. It's kind of, you know, before it's kind of 55% equities and 45% trend. And in after the crisis, equities are still uh, obviously the predominant about 70% and about 30% trend following, right? But nowhere in those two uh, are there any bonds anymore because bonds have not made any money for the last 10 years. If you look at the world government bond index, completely flat. So right. these are very interesting ways of looking at, of course, at the end of the day, they change all the time. So you can't do it like that. But, but I think it just gives people an idea of how much these things can change, but also how consistent, relatively speaking, the trend following part is uh, when you try and build an optimal uh, portfolio. Um, so it's super interesting. Um, right. It, it just tr truly is amazing how poor bonds have been. Uh, and although many people argue that this is the great diversifier and this is the great cushion you had. And when you look at uh, what, what we're seeing is, is that the return, return to risk, you're sort of a risk adjusted, uh, the bonds who are much more a bad investment relative to equities, even, even now is this, is that, so they've been down the ag for a year to date, you're just around 10%. Uh, but you look on a risk adjusted basis, it's, it's horrible relative to equities. So it, and then when you look at this, this kind of environment we had, and this again, goes back to our Rudy Dornbush, uh, comment said, if you had negative interest rates in Europe, is this that eventually there's going to be a day of reckoning? If you have rates that are sort of very low in the United States, there's going to be a day of reckoning. A day of reckoning is, in, is the fact that you don't have any coupon to provide a cushion for when that price uh, adjustment occurs in your bonds. So you have nothing to protect you with this. So you have the interest rate to be able to sort of lean on to try to protect your investment. Now, the same applies to uh, you know trend follower CTA when uh, short-term interest rates were very low. That 
you know, provide a little cushion for performance. In, and that would be like in the, in the 90s when rates were really low, then you have to make up all the, uh, the uh, return based on actual performance. But that's, that now is changing. But we'll sort of say that the bonds have been a very poor investment. And we'd been recommending that, okay, you get rid of bonds or you, 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 if you could get a separate account, sort of do a trend following overlay on top of some of your bond exposure as a substitute for your credit exposure, which we think is uh, would make a big difference. The key important part of all of this is that when you sort of when we started talking about regimes again, was the fact is, is that that trend following is a great strategy in a learning imperfect information environment. And what I mean by that is is that let's assume that we are in um, 1930, okay? We didn't know for uh, that there was going to be a Great Depression, so it had to. Things were going to have to be revealed at time, and there were sort of let's say uh, reversals, and stocks were doing for short periods of time very well. So the idea of a Great Depression was only revealed over time, and so that's uh, and, and in prices. So this is why you want to sort of be in trends because it's it's that's going to show up in the price action. When we look at the Great Recession of 2008, is that we didn't know whether that was going to be a depression. Again, this is that if you follow the trend following, you're 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 using that as a way to uh, to learn what price action is doing and still being having a chance to make money. Yeah, another thing you mentioned earlier, Mark, which I do think is really important to uh, to talk about. Also. Um, it's just this thing about where you um, you made the comment that uh, you know trends can be much longer than than one would expect, um, and and I and I agree with that. But it's quite interesting to me to hear. Uh, I was listening to some political discussions um, because, of course, the point of inflation has now uh, 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 awakened the whole political uh, you know sphere um, because they not just in the USC inflation is the biggest problem for them being re-elected. So I was following a few uh, debates on that over here in Europe and it just is astonishing for me to hear that you know when when these politicians talk about the fact that we've had now at least 20 years of low inflation or no inflation right and and but they all believe that this inflation we're seeing now it's going to be gone in a year right but we're not this is just a little blip it's not going to be a big issue so we don't really need to deal with it we can do a little bit of help here and there and 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 send out a few more checks and and it's good it, it'll be fine not realizing that inflationary regimes if really we have had a, a, a major shift in that can last for very long periods of time as well as can i mean again i believe in cycles frankly and uh, if you believe in the 40-year cycle when it comes to interest rates um where we saw uh, interest rates drop from 1981 to uh, to 2021 um well in theory we should expect that rates over time will go up for the next four decades, and we've only just begun. We're only one year into that. Um, of course, they're not going to go up in straight line. I'm aware of that. So, but it it just puzzles me that that people don't study history more to see what these markets are capable of, to see what these regime changes are capable of doing, and at least be open to it. I'm not saying that it's going to happen. I'm just saying, don't be so narrow-minded that you can only see certain things in one way and maybe that's the trend follow in me that is just you know markets tend to humble us from <laughs> on a regular basis right with things that we couldn't imagine and i just think we need to i can't stress enough i think we need to get that imagination back into the discussion about what can happen i mean even this year right in terms of you know a war in europe and all of the effects that's had. Uh, if someone came th three months ago, uh, say, "Well, Sweden and no, uh, Sweden and Finland are going to join NATO," people wouldn't think that could ever happen. Now it looks like it's happening, and all the other stuff. These are just to mention a few things, right? I think we are really heading. And and I was listening to Ray Dalio earlier today, and uh, he gave it more than a. It sounded to me, he, he kind of said one in three chance, but actually I think it's going to be somewhat higher than that, that we are going to see not only conflict between countries, 
but also internal conflicts, even to a point where maybe, and he was talking from the U.S. perspective, that you're going to see people moving to specific states because of their political convictions, and that could lead to more tension and internal conflict between states in the U.S., just as an example, I'm sure it's going to be the same in Europe and in other places. But this polarization uh, and populism we're seeing at the same time as the economy may be heading south after all of this expansion and all of this funny money that's been pumped into the system. And then at the same time, potentially deglobalization, um, famine, all of that stuff on top of that. I mean, I think the laundry list is pretty long. Uh, in terms of what might be driving the markets for the next 10 years, frankly. So so those are the big issues. We, topic we didn't talk about was uh, sci-fi versus fin-fi, uh, you know, the, these uh, different scenarios of the future, but which are I, I enjoy talking about, but it's hard to make money on. The one thing that I think that uh, everyone talks about the Fed being behind the curve and if it's behind the curve, then the current trends should continue because inflation is going to continue in the near term. So so I think that it's really important for you to have some measure of what it means to be behind the curve. So we came up for one client is a sort of a, a behind the curve template. So we look at the, the uh, Fed funds, effective Fed funds rate minus the uh, a rolling average of inflation to get a real rate. And we look at that against our star, sort of like the neutral rate of interest. And if that's really negative, then you're in a uh, dovish in uh, regime. And we still are. So we have not sort of really moved away. Now, in, a, in the short run, we've actually gotten more dovish because the real, a real rate has actually gone more negative. So we're going to have to close that. And as long as that hasn't been closed, means the Fed is still going to be behind the curve. St. Louis Fed uh, uh, Fed President uh, Bullard actually did a nice piece on, on looking at sort of a conservative approach to the Taylor rule and said, how much are we behind the curve there, which, which you can use his parameter estimates and plug them into the formula. And we need to have, you know, sort of rates go up to about three and a half percent. Okay, so we're way off of that uh, number. Now, if inflation comes down, that number will come down too. So if you look at Real rates versus the natural rate, we're behind the curve. You look at Taylor rule, behind the curve. You look at the short-term, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, slope of short-term rates, we're behind the curve. And so what happens is that from a trend-following perspective, if, I, if you sort of say like, okay, should I stick with trend-following? The answer is absolutely yes as long as the data shows that the Fed and other central banks, and, and a similar sort of story could be told for other central banks like the ECB, as long as central banks are still behind the curve by some measure, then we could sort of see that the trends that we see from, uh, from trend following are going to continue, and holding your trend following exposure would be a, a net positive. That doesn't mean it's going to be a positive every month, but the regime is right for trend following because if you're behind the curve and the objective is to close that gap and it's taking time for them to do that, then that means that the overall trends are going to have to continue. Yeah. Speaking about the Fed, we're actually in, a, in about 10 days, um, so a week and a half from uh, when this episode comes out. We're actually going to be on the podcast having a guest um, who used to work five years at the uh, open market desk at the New York Fed. So having full access to all the information or and and, and to all the big players. Um, so uh, and we we did record that episode a couple of days ago and that's also a fascinating look into uh, the insides of, of the Federal Reserve. Well, well that that'll be a great one to have because I, I put up on one of my podcasts, you know, the uh, comment that bond vigilantes are back. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Now, is a trend follower a bond vigilante? In one sense, by following trend, we're not ahead of it. But at the same time, is, is that we uh, a trend follower in fixed income is agreeing that they were behind the curve and we're sort of, by our activity, starting to force that to, to, to come back to the equilibrium level. But 
why are the bit bond vigilantes back now and why were they not around for a while? This is that, well, the marginal buyer of treasuries, which was the Fed, is no longer there. So now that the marginal buyer has to be a private buyer. So people who have an economic interest in making uh, in buying a bond investment because it will make them money are saying, I'm not getting paid enough to hold these investments. So therefore, I'm going to wait until yields are higher. And there is no government to stop that from happening. So a bond vigilante is a profit maximizer. And when profit maximizers occur, then that means is that b- bad policy will be driven out. And eventually, we're going to ha- have the sort of a movement back to equilibrium. And that process takes time. And that process of taking time is what a trend follower is exploiting. Yeah. No, absolutely. I don't know if you want to just uh, touch on the last point you've written down before we start slowly to uh, to uh, wrap up for today. Uh, but you did write something about China, so I'm not entirely sure what you uh, well what you had in mind. Well, when you look at uh, back in 2008 and 2009, this is that you know the uh, high growth in China basically bailed out a lot of the uh, uh, rest of the world. It was a, They were a driver of growth. If you look at the uh, contribution to growth over the last decade, China has been a major participant or, or the major contributor uh, to global growth. And so what we're seeing is uh, both in the short run because of, of the COVID lockdowns and then also just because of other internal issues of how they want to adjust their economy. If China is not be the major contributor of growth that it has been over the last decade, if they are not going to be the big offset if there's a global slowdown, what is the world going to look like? And I would sort of say that uh, investors are still not focused enough on China growth as a driver of global growth. And I would sort of say that you look at lockdown policies and such, and you look at congestion at ports, you look at uh, the fact that real estate is not going to be a driver in the economy. Overall, this tells us is, is that they are not going to be the same contributor of growth. And then you say, where is growth going to come from? And who's, uh, which economy is going to take up the slack? And what does this mean for uh, the uh, markets overall? And I'd sort of say that following China growth is an important component of f- telling you where future growth is going to come from. Yeah. Now, before um, we talk a little bit about how performance is right now, let me just uh, do a couple of things. One is just to remind you that if you want to be part of this secret project that we are running uh, in the next um, period of time, um, one, you need to be able to keep a secret, very important. But secondly, I would very much like to hear from you if you send me an email uh, to opt in, O-P-T, IN at toptradersonplug.com and just put in the subject line secret project and your name in the email. Give me a few days to uh, respond to you and um, and I will get that done and explain what it's all about. And also let me uh, just tease you a little bit because on Wednesday we're going to have an amazing conversation coming out with Dr. Pippa Malmgren, the former White House advisor, but also someone who's written award-winning books. Uh, she's an entrepreneur. She knows pretty much anything you can throw at her. She uh, briefs NATO generals and all sorts of uh, other interesting people. And it was a very wide-ranging conversation. And she definitely revealed some stuff that I was not aware of that's going on at the moment. So I can't encourage you enough to tune in on Wednesday when we release um, that one. Uh, Performance-wise, not surprising. It's been a good start again to May, um, up 74 basis points in the Beta 50 index, up 15.35% for the year. 1.18% up for the Sokgen CTA index in May, up 2079 for the year. Sokgen trend up 1.26, up 27.58 for the year. And the short-term traders index up 0.85%, up 9.57% for the year. Uh, trend barometer, as I mentioned, 77, super strong. MSCI as of Friday, uh, as of yesterday, down 3.37% in May, down 16.41 for the year. And the world government bond index is down 18 basis points in May so far, up uh, down 7.73% for the year. And the S&P 500 down 2.61 and down 
0857, just to keep things in perspective. Of course, if you wouldn't help, um, we, we would certainly wouldn't mind if you would help, is what I meant to say. By sharing the podcast, there's this link called toptradersunplugged.com forward slash share. So if you would send that to uh, three or maybe five like-minded friends or family members who want to get in on the conversations, maybe it's not the trend-following episodes, maybe it's the midweek ones that are more wide-ranging, global macro, etc., etc., doesn't matter, but we would certainly encourage uh, anyone to uh, help us grow the podcast. Next week, I am joined by Jerry. So that's going to be another episode where we're going to have some, um, let's put it this way, hardcore trend-following conversation. So if you do have questions for Jerry, I know some have already come in, do send them to info at toptradersonplug.com and I'll do my best to, in the most diplomatic way I can, uh, ask some of these questions uh, to Jerry. And um, that's pretty much it. I mean, of course, you can also check out the content on the blog. You know, there's a new update every week or so. And of course, the uh, daily updates on the uh, market scores and the trend barometer is there for you as well. And um, in a few days, I think Rich and I will uh, be able to update the April monthly report uh, for the whole trend following industry, which should be um, interesting reading this month. That's it from Mark and me. Thanks ever so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you next week. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.